Uh, I hope you'll indulge me uh, in, in speaking from the front, uh, deviating from the usual uh, pattern of, of sitting around the table. Uh, this will just sort of be a little bit easier for me to put some of my ideas out there, and then um, I will be happy to sit down and we can have what I hope will be a really free-flowing conversation out of the material that I present. I should say, too, that my project is at the very beginning, uh, and so uh, your insights, your uh, notions of, of directions that the research can go will all be very much appreciated uh, rather than uh, resented. I won't say, oh no, don't make me do that. I'll say, you know, this is awesome, what an excellent idea. Uh, so that, that, that's what I, I hope we'll accomplish uh, in the next bit of time. So, uh, 18th century readers in England and in the American colonies regularly encountered talking banknotes and corkscrews within a literary genre known as novels of circulation, or more frequently within the current scholarship as it narratives. And it's not hard for us today to look back and chuckle at titles like Memoirs of an, the Interesting Adventures of an Embroidered Waistcoat waist from 1751, or Adventures of a Pincushion from 1784, or The Genuine Memoirs and Most Surprising Adventures of a Very Unfortunate Goose Quill. Uh, independent of the questions of these works' literary merit, uh, these narratives share a core sensibility with pre the present-day study of material culture namely the presumption that things possess a social life, that things accrue meaning through their interactions with people, and ultimately that things are not merely passive objects constituted through human action, but rather actors in their own right whose stubborn refusal to follow direction warrants a central place in the stories we tell about the human experience. Now for the talking coins of the 18th century it narratives and for the many current practitioners of material culture studies, circulation proves essential. And this has been the starting point for my study of plantation goods, the hats, hoes, shoes, shovels, shirts, and even whips manufactured in the North for use on Southern slave plantations. And whether passing from hand to hand or moving from the site of production to the site of consumption, as is the case in many uh, of the current commodity studies, uh, it is through movement that stories accumulate and affix to these material objects. Moreover, as we've seen from recent research in geography, uh, there is a radical political possibility embedded in tying together the lives of remote consumers and producers in a broader network of ecological, economic, and ultimately moral relationships. Uh, critical scholars like David Harvey and Ian Cook have long been calling for a scholarship that uh, uncovers the connections between Western consumers and, quote, the distant strangers whose contributions to their lives were invisible, unnoticed, and largely unappreciated. This sensibility has gone outside of the academy to become, I would say, a salient feature of bourgeois life more generally and the shopping and dining experiences that are common to most of us, uh, as sort of uh, made popular through Michael Pollan's Omnivore's Dilemma, and then calling into existence these seemingly endless biographies of celery stocks and artisanal cheeses that we find on the shelves of Whole Foods and in many of our favorite upscale restaurants. Now, my project will necessarily follow a different trajectory insofar as the things that I hope to follow scarcely offered infinite possibilities of self-fashioning that, manuf that manufactured goods elsewhere have promised to their consumers for several centuries now. In my study, the sites of production, small New England villages, witness far greater possibilities for personal liberation and self-making than the, the sites of consumption, that is to say, southern plantations, at least if we're focused on the enslaved men and women who toiled with northern tools and who labored under the hot sun in northern hats and clothing. The goods that I'm talking about ultimately had two sets of consumers, right? The slaves who used them, uh, a category that John Stiles has helpfully called involuntary consumers, drawing on uh, servants and prisoners in 18th century London, uh, whose relationship to the consumer revolution was mediated uh, by their unfree status. So you've got slaves as involuntary consumers, and then planters whose identities were in fact intimately tied to the plantation goods that facilitated the production of uh, agricultural commodities for the world market, and uh, these goods that in their distribution to the slaves allowed planters to make claims to a kind of paternalism and mastery. So the typical frame then of studying the relationship between consumers and producers, say something that would be very familiar to us in, in something like Sidney Mintz's Sweetness and Power, uh, doesn't really fit squarely onto this investigation. 
uh, because in some ways my consumers and producers are situated uh, kind of in reverse here. Um, let me say a few words now about the project as a whole, and from there I want to move into a brief venture into the confounding world of material culture studies, and finally to, con to culminate in a discussion uh, of what we might call the politics of design as relates to plantation goods. Now I began this project uh, in hopes of situating slavery more squarely uh, in the history of capitalism. And I would argue that the relationship between the North and the South becomes uniquely concrete through manufactured goods specifically designed for slaves to use and wear. By following a blanket or a shirt or a shovel from a Northern factory to a Southern plantation, it becomes possible to place wage laborers and slaves, manufacturers and planters in the same narrative of American history and to join stories that are almost always told separately but which rightfully belong on the same page. And it turns out that in their circulation, these plantation goods generated a number of stories, right? The Rhode Island textile manufacturer who conducted plantation to plantation sales on horseback through Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana each winter. The worker at a New England hoe factory who was fired for attending an anti-slavery rally. The Georgia merchant who could not sell a cargo of so-called Yankee axes. The Newport seamstress who spent her evening stitching custom jackets for Louisiana field hands. Mississippi slaves who compelled their owner to provide a second suit of northern made clothing because the first one was so flimsy. The employee of a New York shoe manufacturing uh, enterprise sent to Texas to collect overdue bills on the eve of the Mexican War. Connecticut toolmakers who claimed that they could build an indestructible hoe and the Florida slaves whose strategies of resistance would prove them wrong. It's through these stories uh, that undistinguished material artifacts like a pair of brogans or a sugarcane machete uh, can become vehicles for exploring the largest issues in 19th century American history, right? Capitalism, slavery, abolitionism, and the relationship of the sections and the coming of the Civil War. Now, as I began to think about plantation goods as material culture, I was initially attracted to what has been, uh, at least for the last several decades, perhaps the dominant mode of analysis within the field, a semiotic approach concerned with the construction of meaning and identity through the interaction with things. And indeed, when we think about the movement of, say, a bolt of cloth uh, through the American economy and into different hands, it's very easy to imagine the range of meanings that such an object could generate and the ways in which those meanings would shift from place to place and person to person, right? That bolt of cloth manufactured in Peace Steel, Rhode Island as Negro cloth. Uh, we would begin, of course, with the, this trade name that would take us days, perhaps, to unpack for the ways in which it uh, is embedded with assumptions regarding identity and difference. But in the hands of the man who owned the mill, uh, Isaac Peace Hazard, right? This bolt of cloth confirms his belief that providing warm clothing to slaves is an act of benevolence. The operatives at his factory, however, would have found different meanings in that bolt of cloth, saying little about the slaves destined to wear the products of their hands, but nonetheless invested and cognizant in the rhetorical power that would come from calling themselves wage slaves as they struck for shorter hours and higher pay. Spread on the store's counterpart, uh, countertop here in New York, that fabric would allow urban wholesalers to ply their southern customers for information that could be used in turn then to squeeze the hazards for better commissions uh, and exclusive access to next season's goods. But on the countertop of a merchant in Charleston, South Carolina, right, real retailers might worry that the label Peace Steel, Rhode Island might limit sales of the hazard cloth to customers increasingly hostile to northern manufacturing and the ensuing southern dependence. For the South's aspiring textile manufacturers to encounter a bolt of cloth from the Peacedale mill would elicit words like trashy or sleazy, uh, descriptions of what they saw as substandard and inadequate northern uh, goods that were underselling and undercutting the possibilities for a southern manufacturing economy. But on the other hand, for planters who privileged lower prices over durability, uh, these northern-made goods, this bolt of cloth, would of course speak to their possibilities to assume mastery, to provide for their families, uh, to acquire new lands and new slaves. That is to say, they could see in this cloth 
their own prospects for a better future, even as the consequences of that inadequate and inferior cloth would fall hard on the men and women that they owned, who would be required to exact a season's grueling labor uh, from these textiles that would tear readily on the rough stems of a cotton plant. Of course, in the hands of a slave, right, these goods could also provide opportunities for refashioning outlandish, as they would be referred to in the parlance of the 19th century patterns, into vehicles for self-expression, just as slaves knew how to make their preference for certain colors or certain textures known to their owners. So as that fabric moved from the hands of a Rhode Island operative uh, to the hands of a Louisiana slave, it assumed and created multiple meanings while, assume, while illuminating the simultaneous but wildly divergent realities of 19th century America. And in the book that I'm, I'm writing, uh, basically bringing these stories together is my major goal. But in coming here tonight, I wanted to use the opportunity to think more critically about material culture and to think uh, about what kind of other possibilities would be available for writing a thing-centered approach around plantation goods. So I'm going to spend a few minutes on material culture and return to the it narratives with which I began, asking, uh, if we look at recent scholarship and it, the moves that it has made in this field, what kind of stories could a pair of shoes, a rice shovel, a palm leaf hat tell us? Now it strikes me within the, the scholarship that there's a growing impetus to devote more attention to composition, design, and the constitution of the social in the interaction of, the, of humans and non-human elements. This would involve, as Elizabeth Shove and her colleagues contend in a recent volume entitled The Design of Everyday Life, quote, going beyond the study of things as carriers of semiotic meaning and investing more in their materiality itself. So from reading in a highly theoretical literature in archaeology and in STS, we certainly can follow this possibility of thinking about things in new kinds of ways beyond merely the meanings that accrue to them as they circulate. For scholars in science and technology and society studies, we have the possibility for thinking about things as gatherings or assemblages uh, of physical materials whose extraction, processing, and fabrication attest to what many have called a socio-technological -technolo genealogy through which multiple transactions are made durable. For followers of Bruno Latour, uh, we have the possibility of thinking about a man with an axe not as a human being wielding an inanimate object, but rather as a person-tool hybrid, capable of doing things that neither the human nor the axe could do individually. These are the kind of insights that seem to populate much of the recent work in material culture studies, at least from the sort of sociology of science and archaeological perspectives. Yet I'm really not sure what to do with these kind of insights in regard to plantation goods. Certainly, uh, people like Bruno Latour have drawn our attention to the ways in which design can allow inanimate objects to dictate human behavior. And in his scholarship, he's pointed to things like the speed bump or the oversized fob of a hotel key. Uh, other scholars like Tim Ingold have discussed mass-produced shoes uh, as things that don't just mediate uh, human experience with the natural world, but ultimately call into being the transformation of the natural world itself. In Ingold's account of shoes, it is shoes that call sidewalks into existence rather than sidewalks that call shoes into existence. And human being's ability to walk upon the earth then is constituted at the intersection of the natural and what we might call the unnatural. But again, how do such frames help us think about the experience of enslaved people? Would it make sense to think about the design of a picking bag that an enslaved woman wore in a cotton field of Mississippi and thinking about the ways in which the design of that bag shaped the experience of being a slave. Is the slave constituted at the intersection of the person and the tool, uh, at least in terms of understanding what field labor would have looked like in the 19th century? Uh, and by way of an example, uh, here's a, a Harper's uh, image from, from slightly, from I believe during the Civil War itself, of rice cultivators uh, using hoes. And again, we notice several things about the design of the hose here uh, at first glance, notably that they're so different from the hose that are common in the South in the postbellum period when the short hoe that uh, was emblematic of uh, chain gang labor uh, meant to produce stooped workers who could be surveilled more greatly and efficiently um, by sheriffs and other overseers 
Uh, these are not the kinds of tools that enslaved men and women would have been using in the fields of the antebellum South. The tools that were designed for them to use, in fact, had a greater efficiency and were meant uh, and intended in many cases to increase productivity rather than to contort the body into a stoop position. But again, it's simply by looking at an image like this, we can think about ways in which the tool is not merely an inanimate object, but in the hands of a skilled practitioner, as someone who has spent his or her life in a field, who has understood the ways in which cultivation works, an extension of the human uh, itself and part of that constellation or assemblage that scholars have talked about. Again, I'm not sure if this is a useful observation, but it's certainly where the scholarship might direct us. We might think about the fabric in which these men and women are dressed as perhaps having its own agency, right? Is its unraveling, its kind of, a kind of resistance that the fabric uh, enacts, uh, resisting what's being asked it, it, of it to do by the manufacturers who, who make it, by the planters who distribute it, and by the slaves who wear it. Certainly, if we think about the intersection and interaction of cotton stems, of torn pants, and bleeding legs, right, we can think about human history constructed at the intersection of the human and the non-human. And this is, I think, perhaps useful, but perhaps not the, the direction uh, that we necessarily need to go with this uh, observation. Uh, there's an added complexity to all of this that I should add here, right? When we think about the relationship of the human and the non-human, or the human and the object, it becomes so much more complicated when we're working within a social system that contends that human beings are, in fact, objects, right? To bring some of these insights in material culture to a plantation setting in which human beings are constituted as commodities in the marketplace and in which much, much of the textual evidence that we have seems, seeks to enforce and replicate this presumption, uh, we have several layers of disentangling uh, that we must necessarily undertake. Right, if you look at the plantation journals uh, that overseers keep for much of the antebellum period across the South, you see the confusion of a person for a thing time and time again when enslaved field laborers are referred to as hoes because they are wielding hoes or sweeps because they are wielding sweeps or perhaps uh, most frequently reduced to a single bodily part, the hand, that crucial app appendage that places the human organism in all its complexity to the simple task of harvesting cotton. What I take away from some of these insights is certainly to add and to think more seriously about field labor uh, as not simply unskilled and undifferentiated work, but rather infused with expertise, performance, and a real materiality that's too often overlooked. This might involve thinking about enslaved field workers as practitioners and thinking about the work that they do and the practices as co-evolving with the products, with the objects, with the tools that they are using in the cycle of their daily lives. From this insight, I think it might lead us to a discussion of the design histories of plantation goods, looking for the dynamic relationship uh, of material things and the practices of work, both for mill hands and field hands. Now, in trying to bring these stories together and thinking about the design history of plantation goods, of course, my most recent inspiration is none other than David Jaffe himself, whose important book, New Nation of Goods, sets out a way of thinking about design and the ways in which we must let the artifacts tell their own stories. I've been struck, as I mentioned to David earlier, by uh, one of the criticisms he offers in the introduction of his book of most of what passes for material culture studies in the field of early Republic history which is to say uh, a continuous uh, narrative textual-based interpretation in which he says artifacts are just tossed in as illustrations. In Jaffe's book, the artifacts speak for themselves, and that, I think, is one of the great successes of New Nation of Goods. And I would like to do that. I would like to let the artifacts speak for themselves, but I have a problem which I've not mentioned yet. And that is a very, very limited, to the point of being non-existent, material archive. Plantation goods were designed to be consumed out of existence, and there are very, very few artifacts that would be available to a scholar today who wanted to study the kind of hose or the kind of axes or the kinds of shoes or the kinds of textiles that enslaved men and women wore in their day-to-day -day lives. The fact that, as many observers noted, slaves were dressed in rags and their clothing, clothing seemed to decompose on their bodies over the course of a given picking season uh, would attest 
to the ephemeral nature of this clothing. And of course, there's an irony that comes out of this in an age when papermaking is tied to the rag trade and in which impoverished people commonly sold their scraps of clothing to papermakers. So that my material, um, you know, uh, my material base, the clothing that slaves wore, ultimately would end up being transformed into the textual uh, archive of the ledger book and the receipt uh, out of which I'm forced to write so much of my account. There's very little that's turning up in plantation, in plantation archaeology having to do with the particular sites uh, which tend to be excavated, uh, mostly slave quarters, but not uh, parts of the plantation like tool sheds uh, or fields. And the field surveys that have been done have turned up uh, very, very little uh, in the way of tools relative to things like ceramics and buttons, which are not as essential to my project. Although I think one could definitely do a good deal of work with buttons manufactured in the North for use on slave plantations, but that might not be as exciting as hats, hoes, and whips. Um, in addition, uh, the technologies of a hoe, uh, the technologies of the handles uh, and blades do not change radically over the course of the 19th century so that uh, if these artifacts do survive, it's hard to date them from, say, 1880 rather than 1850, uh, and this presents a problem as well. These goods, uh, whether we're talking about clothing, whether we're talking about um, uh, other kinds of, of, of artifacts, are not readily found in plantation museums throughout the South or in museums dedicated to the study of African American history, nor necessarily in uh, museums dedicated to the study of New England's industrialization. So basically, we are left with a largely textual archive for talking about these plantation goods. I'll take you on a brief detour to give you a sense of sort of where these things show up in compelling ways. Certainly, the plantation account books that a, a wide number of, of, of planters kept that were standardized by the 1850s as these mass-produced documents basically provided a template on which planters could keep track of, uh, of every facet of plantation life and ultimately bring together statistics derived from any number of pages to a final page which would provide an annual accounting revealing whether it had been a profitable year or a losing year. Uh, these plantation uh, records and account books, uh, let me skip that for a second, uh, offered any number of ways of accounting for these plantation goods. So here's a, a typical one uh, that you'd find from a, a Mississippi plantation from 1853 that would have uh, special uh, listings of the kinds of things that you would expect to find. And this would give you a sense of the world constituted uh, of these tools on the plantation. Uh, in this case, not particularly filled out, but in many of the plantation records you find uh, indications of slaves by name and the goods that they're given, uh, oftentimes with, with uh, additional commentary. This is from a, a Georgia plantation in 1859, and you see the hose given out uh, in April 25th by name. Um, these kinds of records are constant uh, throughout plantation uh, record keeping. Um, so you can find, again, hoes, uh, you can find a list uh, by men and women, uh, hoes and axes kept track of. You can find men with hoes and axes and shovels and other, other items. Um, but there is a way in which you can certainly mine plantation records for a good deal of a sense of how these material artifacts play into the political and social relations of the plantation itself. Are these goods used uh, in uh, schemes of reward and punishment? Uh, are these things distributed to individuals or are they held collectively and returned to a common shed every night? If these tools are distributed to individuals on a plantation that uses an overwork system to try to provide, or a, 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 or a, a, a system that asks enslaved families to produce some of their own food supplies, uh, that changes the meaning of a tool and changes the consequences of its breakage. So again, these kind of, these kind of textual uh, records can do some decent work for us. In terms of clothing, we end up with the very small scraps of so-called Negro cloth that are still stick-pinned to any number of letters that travel between New England producers like Roland Gibson Hazard and Peacedale here and his New York merchants uh, Spring Bradley and Buffum. And although this uh, Xerox does not give you a sense of this, uh, these, these textile samples are wide ranging in color uh, with blues and reds and greens and yellows and oranges and numerous plaids. 
And I think if we end up with 50 or 60 of them uh, in the archive of the Hazard Company alone, we might have the possibility of radically rethinking the color palette of American slavery. But we're not doing it based on much else other than a two by three uh, sample. Uh, certainly, we have uh, indications uh, again, in the textual archive of what sort of things are being made uh, in order to provision plantations. And here's uh, the, the basically the menu of supplies that the uh, hazards are manufacturing in Peacedale, Rhode Island. Uh, and these kind of flyers would circulate uh, in places like New Orleans as, merch as planters and factors uh, looked about in order to figure out how to supply provisions for the coming year. Uh, and these, this kind of evidence is quite interesting because, of, of course, it also speaks to the amazing diversity of plantation textiles, right? Moving from an abolitionist literature that would suggest that every single slave was clad in the exact same drab outfit, uh, what these kinds of uh, documents attest to is the wide degree of consumer choice that's available to both planters and if we think about the micropolitics of the plantation uh, of slaves themselves who do seem to uh, exercise some degree of consumer choice, at least as ventriloquized on the, by their planters as they write to their northern provisioners. And as I'll talk about in a few minutes, in the letters that come from factors and planters south from the, you know, to the north, you see time and time again references to my people have complained, my people desire, my people insist, my people were dissatisfied. Uh, all the ways in which this kind of ventriloquism does uh, obviously speak to a rhetorical strategy on the part of planters, but raises the possibilities of slaves acting as consumers through the voices of their nominal owners. But this lack of a material archive, I think, is, is, is a problem for me. Uh, to come back to that, to that point, let me just say, though, that there are some insights from more recent material studies that are focused on the 20th century that actually do have some uses for this scholarship, right? For the modern material culture studies of the 20th century and mass production, right, issues of planned obsolescence, of the presumption of disposability, uh, and of the essential ephemerality of uh, things, these kinds of insights can be quite useful to us. Uh, in theory. I haven't quite figured out exactly what to do with them, but I think there's a place there for it. Additionally, as some scholars have focused on decomposition as a crucial part of material culture studies, figuring out that the same kind of work goes into things breaking down as goes into constituting them, the uh, demise of a slave shirt, the decomposition of a slave hat might be a useful site for thinking about things as gatherings or assemblages. But what I want to do now uh, in, the, in the time that I have left is to talk a little bit more about the design feedback loop between northern producers and their various southern customers. Uh, I think this is a really important thing to, to think about, to think about the actual manufacturing of these goods and how information uh, travels uh, across sections and within communities that lead to the design of a pair of slave shoes or a, a dress for an enslaved woman. I think by thinking in these terms, we can, of course, talk more about crucial kinds of workers who are too often left out of the narrative uh, of American technological innovation, uh, seamstresses, teenage girls weaving hats, uh, and common workers toiling in uh, what is often described as the least skilled of the artisanal trades, the shoemaker shop. So I think this could be useful for laboring history. But it also has a larger consequence for following up on some of the insights that David Jaffe made in New Nation of Goods. That is to think about the kind of places in New England uh, in which rural people's aspirations for material improvement and a modicum of consumer choice impel their engagement with a larger market. So what difference does it make then if we have a small community in New England like North Brookfield, Massachusetts, about 20 miles west of Worcester, that rather than specializing in Windsor chairs, as some of the communities that David talks about in his book, what difference does it make if those entire communities are organized around the manufacture of slave shoes? Does the social texture of those towns uh, operate differently? How does vernacular knowledge figure into the design? What inputs transform uh, that design? Uh, in what sense are patterns centralized, or do innovations come from the day-to-day uh, -day work of common people? Is there a difference between a brogan made in North Brookfield and a brogan made in Brockton? That's a mouthful, by the way. 
Um, uh, I still, uh, this is something I'm, I'm hoping to explore, but I think this is a real question. And certainly, you can find exactly the kind of things that David describes in his book in a town like North Brookfield, uh, where small-scale manufacturing uh, connects to expanding mar market opportunities and ultimately ends up being transformative in the life of that community. North Brookfield was pretty much nowhere uh, at the end of the 18th century. It seemed to be a dying town, uh, at least until shoemaking uh, took hold there in the 18-teens. Uh, there was a congregational minister appointed in North Brookfield in 1798, and he served there until 1862. And so Thomas Snell's account of the history of, of that place is quite remarkable because in his lifetime he could attest to the transformation. Uh, a place that uh, he described initially as, as, as stagnant, as irreligious, but soon, uh, as he said, the prosecution and the extension of this business began to increase our population. Buildings were repaired, children handsomely clothed, new habitations began to rise and multiply, till this flourishing village with a busy population stands before you as the result of diligence and reformation of some of our old and impoverishing habits. As Snell told the story, the key figures were the brothers, Tyler and Ezra Batchelor, who organized the labor of thousands of families in those uh, infamous Massachusetts ten-footers, small workshops where husbands and wives, sons and daughters labored together to turn out shoes. By 1832, the Batchelors were, were producing annually 62,000 pairs of what would become their most famous product, the Russet Brogan, a shoe for slaves. Now, this did not go unnoticed in North Brookfield, where Amasa Walker, uh, his house was reputedly a station on the Underground Railroad, where enough of Snell's congregants were displeased by the fact that the bachelors served as deacons in the church that they seceded in 1853. Um, Snell himself was not particularly happy about this and described slavery as diametrically opposed to Christianity. But on the other hand, he was unsure how to proceed precisely because the wealth that the slave shoe industry had provided in his town was enough to basically create a religious reformation. Um, in his 1854 town history, uh, Snell tried to reflect on this, uh, on the problem of prosperity based on slave shoe manufacturing. He did not offer a resolution. But in this 1854 history, he says, quote, the life of sale shoe manufacturing every considered person knows, is southern slavery. This incontrovertible fact, however, does not prove that the shoe business is wrong or that slavery is right, but it shows one thing that we are all buying and building and riding and wearing and making gains by drafts upon the fruits of slave labor. Not one dollar in fifty passes through our hands that is not probably derived from this source. And whether our feelings or principles accord with this fact, it should certainly terminate all difference and division about, about the appropriateness of what we willingly receive from this source. Now, for Snell, uh, William Lloyd Garrison was a much greater threat to the moral possibilities of his community with his anti-clericalism than slave shoe manufacturing was. But this idea that you could have a fairly open conversation in the middle of the 1850s with this kind of ambivalence about what slave shoe manufacturing could do in terms of creating prosperity, in terms of creating greater religiosity in a small place like North Brookfield is very telling. And of course, what I hope to do then is to connect these kind of broad observations by someone like Thomas Snell to the actual process of design and production of these goods. This is the work that remains to be done. In the time that I have left, though, I want to talk explicitly then about the design history of these plantation goods. I'll tell you very quickly that the title of this talk, Implements Correspondingly Peculiar, is drawn from uh, a correspondent to the, to the Columbia, South Carolina Agricultural Improvement Journal, Farmer and Planter, uh, from 1859. Southern Agricultural Improvement Journal is devoted so much column space to the discussion of plantation provisions in the context both of discussing plantation management more generally, but also in terms of describing southern dependence upon northern manufacturing and envisioning what it would be like to have southern manufacturing that would show those Yankees uh, what for. The column or the, the essay that this quote is taken from reads as follows. It is manifest to every southern planter that the system of cultivation necessary to good and remunerative crops is a peculiar one, hence the necessity and importance of implements correspondingly peculiar that are to be used upon the plantation, 
What we mean is, implements for plantation use should originate with those who know their use and importance, should be conceived and manufactured expressly for the work that they are to perform, and that the instruments suited to the working of a northern farm, though suitably, uh, though fully suited to the work there, may prove wholly worthless to us, at least on many occasions may prove a great loss to us in more ways than one. Now this quote comes out of the context of a world in which most of the provisions and most of the tools being used on plantations are in fact manufactured in the north. Yet there does seem to be a regional or sectional competition over the knowledge and authority to produce appropriate tools for this setting. This should then turn our our attention to, in essence, a consumer-driven design history for something like an agricultural implement. And in doing so, we can connect the lives of and labor of field hands to the kinds of work on a day-to-day basis that northern mill hands are doing. Uh, And this would then connect the labor history of the North to the social history of the plantation in what I hope would be rather provocative ways. Let me suggest we consider the history of the Connecticut tool making company Daniel and Hezekiah Scoville, uh, which came out of nowhere in the 1840s to dominate the hoe market with their planter's hoe, which they boasted to potential customers to be far superior to any hoe now on the market and used by planters in your section of the country. Um, You can see the ways in which this would appear in an advertisement, say in a Macon, Georgia paper, uh, where there are any number of specific branded hoes for sale. Weeds warranted, Scoville's Castile, Braid's Patent, Braid's Crown, Collins Planter, Collins being Collinsville, Connecticut, uh, Bradley's Grubbing, uh, so on and so forth. Again, uh, a great deal of knowledge must be embedded in this and is assumed to exist on the part of factors and planters in going about and deciding what would appropriate tools be for use on their plantation. I'm going to guess that something more is at work here than simply uh, price per dozen. But the Scovilles uh, are an interesting family. Their father uh, had worked with Eli Whitney and had uh, come of age in the Springfield Armory. And he set up a shop in the 1820s in a small village uh, in Haddam, Connecticut, called Higginum. And he began there producing edging tools in the 1820s, or edge tools. The firm sold axes, uh, and in fact, from the very beginning, they marketed one axe as a Yankee axe and a second axe as a Kentucky axe. And this gives you a sense of the ways in which uh, these firms are already embedded in producing for regional markets. The sons, uh, Hezekiah Jr. and Daniel, are born in the 18-teens, and it is the sons who take the firm deeper into uh, the southern market. They're certainly encouraged by the fact that a number of Haddam residents have already settled in Mississippi by the end of the 1830s and that there are family and social networks which open wide lines of communication between Mississippi and Connecticut. And in fact, Daniel ends up serving a mercantile apprenticeship at the end of the 1830s with one of the Connecticut transplants there. And when he returns to Haddam at the beginning of the 1840s, he has it in his mind that if they could invent an indestructible hoe, they will dominate the southern market. By 1844, they've sent prototypes to various southern merchants, and they ask them repeatedly to try them out, to give them away, to solicit information from various planters who have put them these hoes to work on their plantations, and to report back. We would like, and this is you know, from their letters, we should like to have you inform us how the hoes last sent to you suited your market, and what objections are made for them. Please inform us how the planters are suited with the style and quality of our hoe, what objections they make, if any, and also if they suggest any improvements in what they are. For we wish to make an article that will suit them, and we think we have a means of doing so. Um, Their correspondence is filled with these kind of solicitations. Of course, when they receive actual solicitation, or actual advice, right? bevel the edge differently, put the bolts here rather than there. What's interesting is their outgoing correspondence almost always rejects these improvements and <laughs> in, 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 innovations. They don't seem particularly interested in, in, in pursuing this. The, Scoville's innovation, by the way, is to create a, a composite blade which uses uh, cast uh, or which uses steel on top. Let me, let me just get this right here because um, I, I, I want to I make sure that I, that I have this exactly right. Um, Right, they have a a cast steel uh, affixed to iron with the cast steel on top and the iron below. And the idea is that as this hoe is being used, the iron would wear more quickly and so they would have what they touted to be a self-sharpening blade. 
uh, many planters disputed that this was right and in fact asked them to invert putting the iron on top and the cast steel below, but the Scovilles insisted that this would destroy the qualities of their hoe. And clearly they didn't lose enough of the market in their design because by the end of the 1850s they really are uh, among the most recognized and, and successful brand names of hoes in the plantation south. Um, the records of northern firms like the Scovilles are replete with these kind of exchanges. Um, you know, basically companies receiving, uh, soliciting advice from merchants and planters and receiving a number of, of a good deal of advice which they can then uh, deploy within their production process. The people who I'm most interested in in gathering knowledge and, and deploying it within a northern labor setting though are the hazards, the, New England, the Rhode Island Negro cloth manufacturers and their correspondence is quite, quite uh, fantastic in this regard. They have deep family connections in Charleston and when they move into producing coarse woolens for the southern market in the 1820s, they write, ex they write widely to various correspondents hoping to solicit information about what slave clothing should look like. Perhaps the most important letter that comes back to them that I think shapes a good deal of their view on this comes from the Georgia planter James Hamilton Cooper, who sends them an 1823 letter explicitly on, quote, the qualities to be sought for Negro clothing. Cooper explains that strength and a certain degree of softness are very important, and, quote, from the specimens which I have seen offered for Negro clothing, our manufacturers appear, appear oppressed with the idea that anything will do, if it be but sufficiently coarse and very cheap. This is a mistaken idea. Instead, it is necessary to produce comfortable clothing with the greatest economy, as the present feeling require, respecting the treatment of Negroes does not admit any retrograde movement in the supply of their wants. This is an incredible notion, right? We don't usually think about comfort as a motivating idea, and we certainly don't need to take Cooper at his word. But I think the hazards do take Cooper at his word and largely do try to, or they largely envision as they talk about what they're doing, not as skimming off the top of a corrupt system of exploitation as might be expected from their Quaker um, uh, practice, which in Rhode Island in this period is increasingly anti-slavery, but rather conceptualizing what they're doing as benevolence under the logic of, if we don't provide durable and warm clothing to the slaves, the slaves will be cold and that will be worse. And this kind of shared paternalism, I think, ma you know, bonds northern manufacturers and southern, southern planters together. And I need to then trace this into the, the Hazard's own labor management practices in their various Rhode Island factories. But what distinguishes the Hazard's most notably is the amount of time that one of the brothers spends on the road in the south. And their archive is filled with amazing letters back, uh, basically plantation to plantation listings of orders. Uh, that one of the brothers will generate. This is from 1842 when Joseph Hazard uh, travels to New Orleans and then travels up New Orleans, uh, stopping at virtually every plantation he can find, taking orders. And you can see the ways in which various consumers, as, as he conceptualizes them, uh, choose a range of fabrics for their plantations. You can see from this kind of information, you know, uh, the kind of, you can imagine the kinds of conversations he's having as he travels. One could easily map this. But what you also see in these, uh, in these uh, letters back to Rhode Island are, you know, descriptions uh, of clothing, uh, which clearly emerge from interactions with planters or planters' wives describing exactly what the cut should look like. What makes this even more interesting is that the hazards are really the first in the early 1830s uh, to move into ready-made clothing for the plantation market. And in fact, this means that American slaves may have been some of the first working class Americans to have uh, clothing uh, ready to wear uh, arrive on their doorsteps. But what's remarkable about the correspondence back to Rhode Island is that in many cases, it is not simply we need this many of this size and this many of that size. Um, let me find this, but rather, here are Mr. Cobb's Negroes uh, with interesting uh, data generated around them, right? We have one man who's five foot five who has a 39 inch uh, round chest, right? So we understand measurements are being made and if we envision the social relations of the plantation, what does it mean to assemble the slaves 
to force them to stand and be measured. Does this experience mimic the slave auction? Uh, what are the ways in which this uh, you know, uh, resembles other kinds of appraisals of slave bodies? Uh, this kind of evidence, uh, you know, which is not simply something that is observed in the South, but which comes back uh, in vast amounts to northern producers, is quite, quite remarkable. What's even more remarkable is when these listings uh, list not slaves by number, but rather slaves by name, and ask that northern manufacturers sew the labels of the slaves into them, which raise the interesting image of you know, Mrs. Jones, the widow in Newport, who's doing piecework for the hazards, actually stitching a label saying Bertha or Mary or Caesar into the work that she's completing. These letters back, you know, uh, uh, contain other sort of design advice, right? So here's some suggestion that the brogans would be better if you put a rivet uh, at that point, uh, that these might, these might work better. And this kind of correspondence is, is truly voluminous, and it gives you a sense of the kind of collaborations that are involved in designing plantation goods and the ways in which the social relations of the plantation will reverberate in the lives of enslaved people. I'll close this by, by then just drawing your attention to a little bit of the ways in which the marketing of this would work, and then we can open it up a conversation. And what I want to draw your attention he to here is one of the most remarkable documents, uh, if horrifying, uh, that I have found in my research, which is an agricultural uh, catalog produced here in New York um, by A.B. Allen, one of the foremost agricultural journalists, almanac printers, uh, agricultural improvers, of the um, early republic period. But by the 1850s, Allen is publishing almanacs, and he publishes two almanacs, one devoted to northern uh, agricultural goods and customers, and one devoted to southern ones. And so in 1850, his New York agricultural warehouse publishes uh, a southern planter's almanac, which is calculated to the meridian of Charleston, South Carolina, and, quote, with matters suited to all the southern states. And what they do in this almanac is to produce a ridiculously racist catalog of farm implements um, in which they address both slaves and their owners in discussing the merits of various plows. Um, and of course, in doing so, they invoke all of the kinds of politics of the antebellum period. So here in 1850, uh, they're writing as though they're imagining the slave to be their reader. Uh, and they're in conversation with the slave who sees this plow and recognizes that it might be the best plow ever seen. And in fact, it's an abolition plow because it can practically run itself. And that, of course, the joke would be that it's so good that the slave would be then turned out to die because the planter would have no use for him. Um, this almanac uh, makes other references. You know, here we have more friends than all the firm of Garrison, Phillips, Kelly, and company among the sugar planters. Therefore, we propose to show them the figure of a new sugar mill. Um, and there are pages and pages and pages of illustrations of plantation tools with this kind of commentary. Uh, my favorite line in this almanac uh, is one in which uh, they claim, quote, as politics have no business in almanacs, uh, and as the only kind of abolition that the New York Agricultural Warehouse deals in is the kind which abolishes miserable tools, we will go on with our pictorial history of improved implements, right? Um, yes, the only abolition we believe in is the abolition of high prices. This is kind of uh, an, an amazing slogan to imagine. Um, but if this is coming from one direction, from the other direction, attesting to the politicization of this trade, are the kind of advertisements that appear uh, by southern manufacturers who are hoping to break into a market that northerners uh, are, are, are dominating and doing so in, and in these advertisements increasingly making claims to southern nationalism on the, on the eve of the Civil War. So this advertisement from the back of Farmer and Planter in May of 1859 speaks to uh, a new manufacturing concern in South Carolina that's really seeking to break into uh, the trade of producing uh, plantation clothing and drawing particular attention to the low quality of northern goods that uh, they say you know, flood our market each year and do a tremendous disservice to both planters and their slaves. And these kind of advertisements are increasingly common, and you see a good deal of uh, technology transfer uh, of efforts of southern planters and uh, the manufa or southern manufacturers to gather information from northern production to bring uh, northern uh, mill designers uh, and textile manufacturers down. There's an amazing technology transfer and personnel transfer from Rhode Island, Massachusetts, 
to uh, the Carolinas and to Georgia in the 1840s and 1850s, and I think there's a project to be done about those transplants and the kinds of uh, aspirations they have for bringing New England's technological revolution around textile manufacturing to the South. That may be a story for another day. I'll conclude it here uh, simply by saying that we have this trade, that we can see that it is politicized, we can see uh, that it opens up uh, interesting possibilities for connecting the lives of slaves and the lives of northern workers and putting these divergent American experiences uh, on the same page. And we have a body of material culture scholarship that points to some interesting questions, but we have an archive that may not facilitate the answering of them because it is, as I mentioned before, so grounded in textual sources rather than in extant objects themselves. I'll be very curious to hear your suggestions about where this kind of project could go, about what kind of insights from the material culture work that you've been doing could uh, aid the kind of work that I'm doing, and anything else that you'd like to discuss. Thank you. Thank you.